Okay, we'll, uh, we'll move on. So uh, you guys have a test on Friday, covering up through chapter 18. And, uh, and it's only the stuff from chapter 18 covering uh, categorical variables or um, sampling distributions for proportions, okay? The uh, second half of 18 does sampling distributions for uh, sample means. We will not be covering that yet. Uh, that will come later. Uh, so, all that stuff on probability and all that. Okay. Are there any questions or issues before we go on? Yes. So it will cover all the uh, all the stuff from probability. So chapters 14 through 18. Okay. So 14 through 18. Uh, you know, rules of probability and random variables, the uh, binomial distribution, uh, sampling distributions from chapter 18, things like that, okay? Um, multiple choice will be shorter and probably a lot more um, just computational short answer section, okay? And then uh, and there will be a little bit of, uh, what's a free response or just longer answer? What? I don't know how to, what do you call it? It's not essay questions. But. Well, okay. So, what do you? What's the one where you fill in the number? Fill in. Fill in okay. Huh? Okay. Well, anyway, there will be short multiple choice, uh, lengthier portion where you're going to do some computations and you either get the number or you or you get don't get the number, and then there will be a show your work section. Okay. That will that will be Friday, and that's that. Um, okay. And then uh, is Thanksgiving next week? No, the week after. Okay. Good. All right. Okay. So uh, so I'm going to cover chapter 19 today. This stuff will not show up on Friday's test, but I don't know. It's just how the progression goes. Yes. What, what kind of multiple choice can you define? I don't know. Um, I mean, it's not going to be problems, but it's more like wordy. But... Not, not wordy. It'll be kind of like, um, you know, what does mutually exclusive mean or something, you know? Uh, and it means the probability of two events together is zero, okay? If, if two events are mutually exclusive, the probability of those two happening together is zero. Okay, so, I don't know. stuff like that. Okay. Or, okay. Yeah. Something. Like yes. <laughs> is that the explanation? Or? Uh, explanation things. I don't know what you mean by that, but. Uh, It'll, it'll, well, I'll try to write it fair, and if it, if everybody totally bombs, then um, we'll have some talking to do, so. <laughs> okay, um, is everybody okay on chapter 18, sampling distributions? Yeah, for proportions, because everything on chapter 19 depends on your understanding of chapter 18, so. Um, so I hope it's okay. Okay, so chapter, oh. Yes. Chapter 19, um, is on confidence intervals. And the idea behind a confidence interval is this. We want to know something about the population. Uh, but we cannot observe the population directly. So instead of trying to observe the population directly, we take a sample and we observe the sample. Okay, so, uh, so we're assuming we can select a random sample from the population and we can observe the random sample. And based on what we see in the random sample, we want to say something about the population. So. Uh, 
So for example, maybe we are curious uh, what proportion of UCLA students um, consider themselves liberal, okay, in the political spectrum. And so um, maybe we cannot ask all UCLA students directly, that would be the population. So maybe we take a random sample of 300 students. And we ask 300 students, do you consider yourself politically liberal? Some will say yes, some will say no. And, uh, and maybe, uh, I don't know, 60% say yes, okay, at UCLA. So if 60% of our sample says, yes, I consider myself politically liberal, uh, what does that say about the entire population of UCLA students? What, what is the proportion of, UCLA, of all UCLA students that consider themselves liberal? Okay. And, uh, and so we would expect the entire proportion at UCLA to be, if the sample said 60%, we expect the entire proportion at UCLA in the population to be somewhat close to 60%, but not necessarily exactly 60%, okay? So, uh, so how much give or take do we have? That comes down into a confidence interval, okay? So that's the concept behind a confidence interval. Is that idea okay? So we observe a sample based on what we see in the sample. We want to say something about the population. Okay, so uh, keep that in mind. <laughs> And now I'm going to, uh, I don't know, do a little story or illustration here uh, of something else. Okay. All right. So uh, you see this picture. I don't know. You go on Instagram and, uh, and you see this funny picture. All right. And what is this a picture of? Okay. It's a doggy. <laughs> All right, and it says, uh, uh, dog for a walk, hashtag, where's the owner, hashtag, he is invisible, okay. <laughs> I should write hashtag with invisible leash, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, the leash is important, that's why. Okay, so this is a picture of a dog on the uh, football field. The dog is standing at the 30-yard line. But the owner is also somewhere in this picture. But the owner is invisible, and the leash of the owner is also invisible. Okay? But we can see where the dog is. So, what can we say about the location of the owner? Well. Let's say we know something about this leash. Let's say the leash is elastic, so it can stretch. But, uh, but the dog doesn't like to choke himself. So based on uh, the properties of the leash and, uh, and the behavior of the dog, we know, we, know, uh, we know a bit about the behavior of the dog. Okay. And, uh, and because the dog doesn't like to uh, pull too hard against the leash, we, we will say about 60, that's not a 6, um, about 68% of the time, the dog is within one yard of the owner. And then about 95% of the time, dog is within two yards of the owner. Okay, so you guys know where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm. All right, and then so about what? I would say about 99.7% of the time, the dog is what? Within three yards of the owner. Okay. All right, and that, that sounds reasonable, right? The, dot, the leash is a little stretchy, but, uh, 
but the dog doesn't like to pull too hard against it. So we say, yeah, about 68% of the time, dog's within one yard. 95% of the time, dog is within two yards. Okay. So we do not know exactly where the owner is, but we see the dog is standing at the 30-yard line. <coughs> So based on what we know about the dog's <laughs> behavior, what can we say about the location of the owner? Okay. Well, is it possible that the owner is at the 34-yard line, four yards away from the dog? Is that possible? It's possible, but unlikely, right? Because that would mean this picture was happened to be taken in one of those very rare times where the dog is pulling really hard against the leash or you know behaving in a way that is not not usual okay? but it's technically possible that the owner's out at the 34 yard line technically okay um, but we would say you know the owner is more you know we would expect the owner to be somewhere between what like the 28 yard line and 32 yard line huh? so Maybe I can write a statement like, like this. I am 95% confident that the owner is between the 28 yard line and 32 yard line. Does that seem reasonable to say? Okay. And so the idea here is that even though we can't see the owner because the owner is invisible and the leash is invisible, we do know that because we know that we understand the behavior of the dog, by seeing where the dog is, we can get an idea of where the owner is. Is it possible that the owner is outside of this range 28 to 32 yards? Yeah, it's possible. But because we know that 95% of the time the dog remains within two yards of the owner, we can be 95% confident that the owner is technically within two yards of the dog. Okay, is that fair? All right, so this is... Uh, this is similar to our idea with a confidence interval. Okay? The idea being the population, whatever proportion exists in the population, is like the invisible owner. Okay? We cannot observe the proportion in the population directly. We cannot, and unless we asked all UCLA students, do you consider yourselves politically liberal or not, we, can't, we don't know the proportion that exists in the population. What we can observe, though, is the location of the dog, or the proportion in a sample. We can take a random sample from the population and directly observe the proportion that exists in a sample. Okay? So we can see the location of the dog. We can see the value uh, that exists in a, uh, in a sample proportion. Okay? And we also know the behavior of the dog, we, from chapter 18 and the sampling distributions, we know that the, uh, that p hat, the sample proportion, comes from a normal distribution, okay? Uh, as long as those conditions are met, you know, the uh, random, randomly selected sample, not more than 10% of the population, sample size bigger than, or n times p and n times q, both bigger than 10, we know that the behavior of p hat follows a normal distribution. And when, by knowing that it comes from a normal distribution, we know that 68% of the time it's within one standard deviation of the mean, 95% of the time it's within two standard deviations of the mean. Okay? So we know the behavior of p hat, and we can observe p hat. So by observing the location of the sample proportion and knowing the behavior of the sample proportion, we can then make a statement like this about the population proportion. Is that, is that good with everyone? Okay, so if I turn this 
away from dogs and uh, um, invisible owners, we can talk about uh, sample proportions, okay? So we cannot observe population proportion P directly. can observe p hat, the sample proportion. And as long as the conditions are met, we know that p hat comes from a normal distribution where the mean is p. Okay? And so from this, we can then make statements about the population proportion p. Okay, so we This knowledge, So, um, what we do know is that p hat comes from a normal distribution centered at p and standard deviation p times q over n square root. Okay? And so, um, when we look at um, the normal distribution, and we look at z scores, okay? If I look at z scores, technically to get the middle 95%, I would want 2.5% over there and 2.5% over here. And when I go to the, uh, the z table, it's technically not 2, it's technically negative 1.96 and positive 1.96, okay? So, um, based on the location of p hat, I can say, you know, I am 95% confident that p is within plus or minus 1.96 standard deviations of p hat. Part okay. If I'm not losing anybody along the way. Um, yes. What's the difference between p and p hat? Okay, so p is the population proportion that we want to know, and p hat is what we can observe from a sample. So we don't know p. We're trying to make. I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> Sounds like stunts. Um, uh, we want to know, make statements about p, the population proportion. Okay, this is what proportion, so in my example I'm saying, what proportion of UCLA students consider themselves politically liberal? Okay, uh, that, that is p. We don't know that number directly. What we can do is we can take a random sample of students and we can observe p hat. Okay, so maybe, maybe the true value of students who consider themselves politically liberal at UCLA. Maybe that's 59.4%. I have no idea. I'm completely making that up. Okay. Whereas, uh, you know, when you take a random sample, 
maybe the random sample reveals, uh, you know, you interviewed 100 students and maybe 60 of them said, I consider myself politically liberal. So your sample proportion is 60%, okay? Population proportion, not necessarily equal to that, but we expect it to be somewhat close. All right, so is this, is this part okay? I'm 95% confident that P, the population proportion, is within, you know, 1.96 standard deviations of my sample proportion. Is yes. there a reason we use 95 instead of the 99.7? Um, Just for easier... You know, activity. technically we can make any level confidence interval that we want, okay? For better or worse, 95% is the one that's most commonly used. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, well, there's a long history behind it, but it just kind of, this is the number that people have decided to go with most often, okay? But if you want to say, I want to make a 97% confidence interval, you are entirely allowed to do so, okay? This is America. You can choose a 97% confidence interval if you want. Um, and and what, we, what would you do? You would not choose 1.96, but you would go to... Uh, for a 97% confidence interval, you would go to the Z table and you would want the middle 97%, so you would have 1.5% over here, 1.5% uh, over there, and you would need, you would need a different value, okay? And, uh, I can't. So 1.5% would be negative 2.17, okay? So you would use negative 2.17 and positive 2.17 as instead of, <laughs> of 1.96, you would use 2.17 if you were making a 97% confidence interval, okay? But for better or worse, 95% is the one that's most commonly used, okay? Oh, I did this very quickly, but is that okay? I don't. All right. So anyway, there is one slight problem here. Can you guys see uh, where we might run into trouble with, I'm 95% confident that P is within 1.96 standard deviations of P. Pat? The question is, how big is a standard deviation? Okay. Technically, when we look at the normal distribution, or the sampling distribution, this is the standard deviation, right? And this relies on knowing what P is, okay? But the entire premise is that we don't know P, okay? So how can we make something about P over here, all right? So uh, we just kind of wing it, and, uh, and we do our best guess. And, uh, and, it, and mathematically, it turns out our best guess is our best guess. Um, so we're going to use p hat instead of p for here, okay? So for the standard deviation, we're going to use p hat times 1 minus p hat, which the book calls q hat, over n times the square root. Okay? Or the book, the book writes p hat q hat over n square root. It's the exact same thing, right? So even we don't know what this is because we don't know p, we're going to just take our sample proportion p hat and just plug that in and use that as our standard deviation. Okay? All right, so let's try uh, let's try an example, okay? <coughs> All right, so we ask uh, does anyone, uh, I don't know, work for the Daily Bruin and uh, know approximately what percentage of UCLA students consider themselves politically liberal? No? Any idea? Does 60% sound reasonable or? Okay. Huh? Too low? <laughs> Alright, I don't know. 60% uh, that's like 40 to 60, so it's like one and a half for every one. I don't know, maybe that is too low, I have no idea. Definitely more liberal than Texas, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but so is everywhere else except for Utah and Wyoming, okay. Um, all right, so what, 
what percent of ECLA students uh, are politically liberal? Who knows? Okay. Uh, okay, so let's say we um, we take a sample, take a sample, random sample, I should say, random sample of 100 students. Okay, we'll say 60 of these students. Well, maybe, maybe, you know, a lot. I'm sure consider themselves moderate or conservative. So, 60 of these students say they are liberal. Okay. Okay. Make a 95% confidence interval for P. And what is P? P is the proportion of UCLA students who are politically liberal. Okay, so our P hat is 60 divided by 100.6. Okay, for 95%, I've already told you, but we're going to go within 1.96 standard deviations of p hat. Okay, so we got to figure out our standard deviation. The standard deviation, and actually, when it's technically when it's when we are using the sample proportion. I don't know why my brain just stopped working. Okay, when, we, when we're using the sample proportion p hat, rather than the actual value p, we call this the standard error, okay? Not, I guess it's important, all right. So the standard error is going to be <coughs> p hat times q hat over n. So that's going to be the square root of 0.6 times 0.4 divided by 100. I get the square root of 24 which is pretty much 5, but not exactly 5. So, 5.87, I'm 4 point, okay, square root of 24, 4.899. Okay, so 4.9. Oh, what am I doing? <coughs> The standard error is 0 0.049. Okay, so when I make my confidence interval, I'm going to do 0 0.6, okay, 60%, plus 1.96 times 0.049 on the high end, and 0.6 minus 1.96 time, um, times 0.049. And so here I get 0.696, and over here I get 0.504. All right. So our conclusion is then. I am 95% confident that the proportion of students at UCLA who are liberal um, is between 0.504 and 0.696. Okay, so basically, I'm saying I'm 95% confident that the proportion of students who are liberal is between 50% and 70% ish.
And so all of this stuff, this is summarized in uh, our confidence interval formula, which would be p hat plus or minus, um, I'm going to call this z star, times the square root of p hat times q hat over n. Okay? z star is the, the value uh, from, the ta from the z table. for the uh, level of confidence. So for a 95% confidence interval, Z star is 1.96. For any other level of confidence, you would go to the table and find out, uh, find the Z score that you need to get the middle whatever percentage. Yes? What does SE mean? SE is the standard error, OK? This is technically so when it was p times q without the hats over n the square root that's the standard deviation of the sampling distribution okay um, if we knew what p was and if we knew what q was that that's what we would use okay but we don't know so we're doing our best guess for what this standard deviation of the sampling distribution is by using p hat and q hat okay and so check to distinguish between the standard deviation of the sampling distribution and our estimate of that we call this the standard error okay, okay. so for 95% Z star is equal to 1.96. Right. If I wanted to create a 90% confidence <laughs> interval, where would I look in the Z table? Where would I look up? 90%. Okay. So if I want a 90% confidence interval, I want 90% in the middle, which means how much do I have in each tail? 5%. Okay. So I would go to the table and I would look up the z-score that gives me the area closest to 5%. And that would be negative uh, 1.64 and negative 1.65. So a lot of times, um, well, technically you could use either of those, but uh, we might split the difference and use negative 1.645. Whether you use 1.64, 1.65, or 1.645, that that doesn't exactly matter, okay? All right, is this okay? All right, notice that I'm writing, I am 95% confident that the proportion of students at UCLA who are liberal is between 50, 0.504 and 0.696. I do not write, and this is important, I'm not writing there's a 95% probability that the proportion of students at UCLA who are liberal is between 0.504 and 0.696. So notice I'm writing confident and I'm not saying there's a 95% chance or a 95% probability. Why not? Okay, so let me, uh, here, we'll, we'll try and decide here. So I have a quarter right here, okay? I'm going to ask you. What is, uh, what's the, pro I'm going to flip this coin. What's the probability that it lands heads? 0.5, right? Okay, so I'm going to, okay, and I'm going to ask you, what is the probability that it landed heads? Okay, so think of your answer there. All right, now watch what I do. What is the probability that it landed heads? Okay, so it was the last two questions were trick questions. So before I flip the coin, and I said, what's the probability that it will land heads? 
you can say 0.5, and that is correct. Okay? However, once I flipped the coin and once it landed, my question of what is the probability that it landed heads, that, that's actually a meaningless question, okay? Because the coin either landed heads or it didn't land heads. So there's actually no probability associated with it. Probability is only for uncertainty, okay? It only it expresses uh, a level of uncertainty regarding the outcome of an event. With the landing of the coin, once it has landed, there's no more uncertainty. It either landed on heads or it didn't land on heads. So there's no more, um, there's no, nothing to say about the probability. All you can say now is, I am 50% confident that it landed heads, or I'm 50% confident that it landed tails, because you don't know how it landed, but there's no longer a probability associated with it, okay? At least, you know, when we're taking the frequentist view of probability. So when we're talking about the proportion of students at UCLA who are liberal, or whatever the population proportion P is, there's no uncertainty about it. This is a property of the population, okay? UCLA has this many students, this many students consider themselves liberal. There's no uncertainty about that proportion. That proportion is set. If we could observe all the students and ask, you know, how many of you are liberal, we can get that proportion P directly. There's no uncertainty about it. We just don't know if that P is within this interval or not, okay? All we're hoping for is that that it is, okay? So we're saying we're 95% confident that it's in between here and here. But the truth is, is that P could be 73%, okay? If P was 73%, what happened then is that my random sample of 100 students was just one of those weird random samples that gave me too low, too few um, students who considered themselves liberal, okay? Or if the proportion of UCLA students who are liberal was truly 73%, every time I take a random sample of 100, I'm expecting something around 73% to be liberal. But my random sample might, have get, might give me 60%, and therefore it leads me to conclude that my 95% confidence interval looks like this, even though um, it's... P is not actually in the interval. Okay. So, um, let's see. What do I want to write on the board? So I will write like this. And I will say, also, um, study the statements on page 459. Okay. So study page 459 on uh, the proper interpretation of a confidence interval. Okay. So uh, do not say a 95% chance that P is between 504 and 0.696. Okay. There's no uncertainty about P, so it doesn't make sense to talk about chance or probability. So P either is in the interval or it's not. Okay. But based on our interval, could I say I have reason to believe that P is not 73%. Yes, okay. So if our sample showed uh, 60 out of 100 students um, declare themselves liberal, then our confidence interval goes from 0 0.504 to 0.696. And, that would, and then we would say, I have evidence, or I have reason to believe, that the proportion of students at UCLA uh, who are liberal is not 73% or is not 72% or is, is not any value outside of this. Is it possible that it is? It's possible. 
But based on what we observed in our sample, we have evidence that it's not, or reason to believe that it's not. Okay, so we can say. Um, We have evidence or reason to believe P is not, let's say, 73% or any other value outside uh, the interval. Okay. Technically, it is possible. P is 73%, okay. but that would mean our random sample uh, was quite unusual. So good. Okay, uh, and again, all of this stuff regarding confidence intervals depends on the idea that the uh, sampling distribution follows uh, the normal model. Okay, and so um, when you do a problem for confidence intervals, you need to check the conditions to make sure, um, remember to check conditions, check the conditions uh, so that we know, so we can assume the sampling distribution of p hat Uh, is a normal uh, follows the normal model. Okay. So you might see. So we, the normal model uh, sampling distribution from the normal model and those conditions we've already covered in chapter 18. So I consider those questions fair game for uh, Friday's test. So, you know, I might say, are any conditions violated? Okay, and we need to check what are the conditions? The random and independent condition or randomization condition, random and independent. Um, uh, what does the book call? Oh, the book calls it the 10% condition. But basically, this one is sample size not too big. And then the other one is the uh, success failure condition. Which is sample size is not too small. So that means n times p has to be bigger than or equal to 10. And n times q has to be bigger than or equal to 10. today. So we'll see you guys on Friday and uh, that'll be that. Okay. <laughs>